and welcome to Over Underrated, a music podcast of Fran and Babs. I am Fran, and here is my co-host, Babs. How are you doing, Babs? I am good, thank you, Fran. I am drinking a 12.1% beer called Hive Mind, which has some little honeycomb on it, and it's a, quote, imperial double mash honey and walnut stout. So let's see how hammered I am by the end of this recording. Did you pick up in some sort of networking event? <laughs> I did not. It's Brussels no. Beer Project. It is very oh. much homegrown, like probably brewed. I don't know. Let's convert this into miles for the British people. Two miles down the road from me, even though they have a, a newer, bigger, fancier brewery, maybe four miles down the road from oh. me now. I don't know where my nearest brewery is. Um, I'm drinking delicious water. Delicious. Um, well, delicious. Is it delicious though? In uh, well, current it's all right. Times. It's all right. Um, I'm trying to, to get off the old Pepsi Cherry Max. A um, Herculean you know, task for you, I imagine. Is you know, it was a lockdown addiction. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to uh, reduce it, but then I'm left with nothing nice in my life. No alcohol. Speaking of drinking, I had a surprise celebrity spot in Brussels yesterday. I didn't even think about doing a quiz about this, but let's just say it is a comedian from Down Under. Any guesses? Uh, Reese Nicholson. It what? Ding, ding, ding. Oh, hello. <laughs> like, it, what? Wow. <laughs> I was about to be like, do you want a clue? His hair is very uh, <laughs> striking. Yeah, I saw Reese and his husband, Kyron, uh, go for a drink in a bar next to the restaurant where I was having lunch yesterday, totally unexpectedly, and I thought about going up to him but because he was with his husband and you know they seem to be having a chill time I actually didn't in the end but um I then stalked him on social media and it seems he's going to London so they had a bit of a stop off in Brussels but that was my unexpected Brussels celebrity spot of I'm gonna say the year (laughs) did his nails match his hair they usually do I couldn't see his nails from the distance but uh you know it's that thing of you're like oh there's a man with some striking hair looks like oh it is (laughs) So uh, yeah, cheers to you, Reese Nicholson. Yeah, but have you been listening to anything exciting this week, Babs? Oh, I've actually been listening to quite a lot this week, more than usual. I feel like, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but I've been listening to less podcasts and more music <laughs> recently. So I've been listening to the new Shy Girl EP called Nike, and I've rediscovered a band called Sluts of Trust that I don't know if, if you've heard of or not. I'm They're... not aware. <laughs> They are a loud Glaswegian two-piece for, I would say, fans of McCloskey. Oh, okay. Which is really good. And uh, my discovery today, I shazammed a song from a video of a chonky cat going up some stairs. (laughs) And it turns out it's a song by a Canadian rapper called, the song's called Nursery, and he's called BB Noss, Mm -hmm. with the S as a dollar sign. And I thought, gosh, I am in the 21st century shazamming a song from a cat video to find out what it is. I've never used Shazam in my entire life. No, oh, Fran! I've discovered I discovered Sonic Youth. Did you really? Shazamming a Gilmore Girls episode. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think my friends had tried to get me into them before, but it didn't click. But uh, there was an episode where they're playing Cool Thing, and I shazammed it, and I was like, Ah, this is my gateway into. Oh my god! Like I, I've shazammed for as long as I've had a smartphone, and you know, you can link your Spotify playlist to to Shazam as well. So then it just kind of shows up, and you can go and listen. Well, to think of the songs I've missed out on because I haven't shazammed anything. <laughs> I've been listening to a band this week called Coldplay. Um, oh know? yeah, I've yeah. seen this on social media. Yeah, I thought you know, I used to love Coldplay back in the noughties and I was like always defending them. And then in the last twelve years, it's been hard to defend because they became kind of a, a, a mediocre pop band. So I thought mm-hmm. I'd re-listen and we uh, re- recalculate. What, what songs I like and what songs I hate. And um, turns out, yeah, I still did like the last four albums. Yeah, I unfortunately stopped after the first two. I think the first two are great, but apart from one song here or there from, from later albums, it hasn't really chimed with I me. I was still, you know, wave my hand and say that Viva La Vida is the best album and people still listen to the fourth album. The Brian Nina album. I mean, is that Milo Zolotto? No, no, it's one four, but that, that's where it went downhill, is Milo Zolotto oh. okay. with Rihanna. But Viva La Vida, because I hate Violet Hill, but everything else on that is pretty pretty decent. Give it give it a try, music fans. I know it's Coldplay, yeah, but to be it's honest, okay. No, I, I would. I remember Pete Perfidus saying, like, I don't understand, you know, why people keep knocking Coldplay when, when they're so good. Even though, I, so I've just read Pete Perfidus' book, Broken Greek, mm. 
And uh, I didn't realize I had such a different music taste from him. Like he definitely loves pop and knows way more about reggae uh, than I do. Uh, very interesting read. Would Most people know more about reggae than I do, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. well, I guess he's from Birmingham, right? Uh, and I think yeah. there were lots of kind of homegrown talent. But yeah, it, it was very interesting. But we're going geographic today mm. for, for our picks. Uh, maybe not four miles down the road from you, but maybe 200. I have no idea. How far oh. Nottingham is from where you are? Let's say four hours. In in the car. In, well, yes. <laughs> four in four, four hours. We're going past London, past Milton Keynes, to a world I've never been to, the East Midlands. To I'm surprised that you've never been. Any reason? Um. Well, I mean, here's some facts about Nottingham. It has the highest gun and knife crime in the UK and burglaries. Yeah. So that that's not helping the cause, to be fair. <laughs> although... I, I've heard this for a long although time. Although it does yeah. have a, a venue called Rock City, which obviously, you know, I, I feel like I need to experience the, the city of rock. Um, city of rock. But yeah, I mean, I support Derby County, who are the rivals next door, but, mm. you know, like, there's nothing really major for me to go to Nottingham. I have my own forest down here in Dorset. And that's enough. That's, that's, that's enough forest for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm a habit itself. Well, Nottingham was one of my six UCAS choices. Mm-hmm. I ended up going to Warwick, but I did visit Nottingham campus, which seemed very nice, but ultimately I ended up going to Warwick. And I've been back since because I've had some friends who lived in Derby and then lived in Nottingham and got married there in 2019. And yeah, it was very nice. I stayed in a, in a hostel in the city centre. The wedding was kind of just outside in this kind of leafy area. And the next day, me and, and two of my friends were also saying centrally, we were going to try and go to the castle, but it was closed for renovations. So we ended up going to this event that was quite mad and random, where it was like the posh part of Nottingham. Houses opened up their gardens to like show people around gardens, to have activities. There was music playing. Mm-hmm. They were selling food and drink. So it was totally, you know, kind of, yeah spontaneous it was quite fun we're like what should we do let's walk over here oh there's this whole event going on and yeah we ended up in a in a kind of park that had this whole food and drink market set up basically so i i have nothing but positive things to say about nottingham there's some had some very good coffee at 200 degrees that i still follow on instagram and uh yeah makes me feel nostalgic for it so i would say give it a visit i didn't know about the city of rock uh you know so (laughs) why not why not combine trip and and go and check out Robin Hood. Well, I can't comment apart from the st- stats, guys. But if you're in Nottingham, let us know where to go. Indeed. But we're discussing two bands from this city. Indeed. We have the overrated choice of a London grammar. Who met at the University of Nottingham that I just mentioned. They did, although none actually held from the area. Though one is from another end, Northampton, the, the home of Alan country. of Alan Carr. So yeah, um, <laughs> is it is. Yeah, yeah. his dad managed the football team, I believe. Did so yeah, so Nottingham, we have London Grammar, and the underrated choice is a little indie band called Six by Seven. Overrated. We will start off, I believe, with a. Uh, the overrated pick with a London Grammar. So, Babs, what do you know about London Grammar? So they're one of those bands that, for me, falls into the vague churches, Wolf Alice of, right, they have, I think they all have three members, one woman. They're more popular than average, but I don't really know what they sound like. Is it indie? Is it pop? Is it rock? Who knows? I obviously had heard of them and knew they were massive, um, but... My memory was that every time I listened to them, I thought, yeah, they're fine, but nothing further. Turns out I had one song saved uh, Mm -hmm. from March 2022, which is one that's on your playlist. So I'll get into it when that happens. But I had no memory of it. (laughs) I wonder (laughs) if it's because you shared it or someone else that I know who who likes them posted it. So, yeah, I, I wanted to do this to kind of, you know, firm them up more in my mind and to to kind of explore why. I hadn't really engaged with them. hadn't really They hadn't really clicked for me. Yeah. So at the moment, no, we haven't chosen London Grammar because, like other episodes, 
somebody hates the band or has a, a bone to pick with the band, we're just, you know, throwing up the option. Are they overrated? I mean, they're, they're one of the most popular bands in the UK. Mm. That they, they do well. I know in Australia, I know they, they're known around the world. So do they deserve the success? They've had three albums and they've been around for the past 10 years and had an album out last year. And yeah, I mean, I was at Camp Festival in 2012 and they were just on the lineup at a family festival and thought, aren't they like quite another like height? It's a random like mm. it's a random selection for a family festival. Mm. And then I just went along, literally I hadn't even heard uh, anything and suddenly yeah, three get people went on stage and then, you know, just a guitar player, keyboardist and this, you know, uh, blonde beautiful lady who had this voice which didn't seem to match. <laughs> like, mm. where did that voice come from? <laughs> And then, yeah, and as a live performance, I mean, it's just, they, I think they, even, they were all sat down and it was kind of like, you know, like a uh, stroke of chin nod. Mm. But I was, no, but her, yeah, I think her voice is, and if you see any comment on the band, everyone talks about Hannah Reed's voice because, you know, it's beautiful. And I guess it's it's kind of mixed. It's, like, it's kind of like Florence Rose from Florence Machine and Anna Lennox kind of feel. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I, I then the album came out and I thought it was fine, but I thought to myself I couldn't cope with this. For <laughs> I mean, it's like it's 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 I think it's, it's too it's, taxing on the mind. <laughs> it's, it's like it became a bit samey, and then like I later discovered they had remixes by High Contrast, a drum bass artist. And I enjoyed them through the eyes of mm. high contrast. Mm. <laughs> and then I kind of like walked away from London the grammar. Then they just seemed to be this like act who were getting bigger and bigger. But I had no, I'd shuffled away. So with this podcast and doing my research, I've actually listened to most of the songs for the first time. Oh, right. I, I didn't realise. I thought, I thought this story was going to finish with, you know, like I saw them in 2012, committed fan ever since. <laughs> because yeah, the tracks you provided, it's quite spread. From, from all their albums. I put on a mix of the songs in the past 10 years, and then, yeah, then I'd... A couple I'd heard, obviously, you know, on, like, TV and radio, et cetera, et cetera, but, yeah, most of them was the first time I heard them when I put them on the playlist, so mm. it was an interesting journey. It, okay, so we're both, we're both going on a journey today. Mm. Well, let's begin the journey with the first track. So uh, we have Baby It's You. I thought I'd go for a recent starter. This is uh, from last year. It's kind of like uh, a more electronic version of the band sound. Like when it first came out, they're a bit more stripped back. It's just more like gentle piano, gentle guitar and her strong vocal. This feels more like a, a, a more produced, more textures. The lyric apparently is when she first heard the music, she thought of herself being at a festival. So this is her mm. visualising herself at a festival, being in love with someone for the first time. Oh, I'm looking up the lyrics now then. <laughs> Although, I, yeah. it feels like it should be a house banger, which has been slowed down. Because a lot of the elements are very like dance elements, but with a very slower BPM. So I was wondering if there is a decent remix of this with a faster BPM to see if it could be like an IB for Anthem. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. How about you? So this wasn't what I expected uh, Mm. from them. I thought it was much more, I wrote some very technical terms, percussion E and dream E than Mm -hmm. I expected. And I was like, oh, okay, I think I could get into this. But when the piano comes in with her vocals, I find it lets down the song a little bit. And that's something I'm going to keep coming back to, not all the time. Um, But here, I really like the beats and the synth, so I can totally see what you're saying about it being kind of a, a club banger. But I don't like the bits with just piano and her voice, especially on the second chorus when it, it you know, it's quite rousing mm. and then it just slows down. In that case, you probably hate the first album. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's mainly just a piano and voice. And well, guitar. but it, it, the thing is, sometimes it works, is what I oh, found. Okay. It's uh, definitely a song by song basis. Um, I can't deny that, as with a lot of their songs that got stuck in my head, you know, I was thinking about how. You know, you've re- recently given me Japan, Sea Power, even the underrated acts from today where it's like, these. those are not songs you can listen to once or twice and get a feel. With London mm. Grammar, I definitely got a feel and definitely um, 
things got stuck in my head all, all the time. And yeah, you know, as, as a kind of initial introduction to her voice, as you say, um, Florence and Annie Lennox, uh, I also saw Judy Cruz, you know, the Twin Peaks soundtrack yep. singer. But for me, more than anyone, uh, she really reminds me of a definitely an underrated band, Abby Woodman from Martha Gunn, who are not a very uh, well-known band there. I, I don't really know how to describe them, kind of Fleetwood Mac with synths. Something, okay. something like that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm on board with that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've talked about them before. They, they have a phenomenal version of "Cause uh, I Love You" by Lizzo, but they, mm. they make it rock. And their song "Honey, Let Me Know" is a stone cold classic for me, like a, a modern classic. And, and yeah, Abby definitely has a very similar sound. Maybe, maybe there's more layers to um, Hannah's voice, but uh, it really, really reminded me of that. And of course, an excuse for me to talk about an underrated band that I love. So check out Martha Gunn. It's kind of extraordinary that these are just three people who met at university. Like, you know, mm. it's just a, an organic meeting. I mean, like Coldplay, every... like Court J, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, to have, yeah, to have, yeah, but to find someone who's that amazing. No. Mm-hmm. You, you think they maybe have gone for like Brit school or a finely trained, you know, singing, mm. but yeah, it's the so yeah, it's kind of extraordinary. But um, yeah, moving on to the next track, which is Strong, which I think is one of the most famous songs mm-hmm. of the first album. Um, I believe it won an Ivan Novello. Oh, wow, imagine if you're with your first album writing an Ivan Novello, Jesus Christ, that's a lot of pressure. Too early, too early, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at the uh, YouTube comments, and the guy called George goes, What a voice, but I don't want to sound like a pervert. What? Okay, this is where people start getting a bit, you know, what women don't like, it's when they're reduced to only kind of physical attributes or, you know, when when you're talking about someone's talents, you know, it's like, oh, she plays guitar well and she's fit. Complimenting someone's voice is absolutely fine, George. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, oh, George, he's confused. But at least, at least he's he's thinking. He's trying. About... He's trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I guess this is a classic London grammar sound are you a fan of the name london grammar i don't know i i i think it's clever on the one hand because i i am a fan of kind of two random words suddenly having a meaning like arctic monkeys or mm-hmm. razor light or aforementioned coldplay but i think maybe because we've just done a vampire weekend episodes as well i would imagine a more old-fashioned band not a modern band with that name I don't know. I can imagine like the London grammars and there's some men in suits in the 50s. Not this. Because when I heard the name, I was expecting like a Libertines knockoff kind of mm. act of the London grammar. But, to yeah, like Towers not... of London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I think they said, oh, but it sounded international, so they kept it. But um, yeah, it's like I said, yes, it's a classic sound with uh, vocals being up front and then to some, you know, light um, instrumentation. Take away her vocals. To me, it sounds like the backing music of an online tutorial. <laughs> if that helps. <laughs> uh, well, I kind of agree with you because I've written that I really love her voice here. And it's obvious, you know, this is a song too, but it's obvious that it's one of the band's best assets. Mm. But I'm wondering at this point whether the band relies on it too much. And I feel they kind of do here. And like, I don't really like the echoey piano again. I I think maybe I have a situation with you and horns with piano where <laughs> it's not like I don't like piano, but when I dislike it, it really kind of um, doesn't redeem a song for me. And just before recording, you sent me the high, high contrast remix, which mm. is which is better. It's more energetic and it has these kind of off kilter, off rhythm guitars in, in some sections, but it didn't do enough to redeem it for me, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So, cause I, yeah, cause if you ever want to get into the band and you think that it's a bit too samey, try the high contrast remix of the whole album. Because for me, yeah, it helps. It helps. It's, yeah, like, it's, a, it's like a couple of that. sugar. It's like a couple of, of, of sugars in, in your first coffee, you know. Lovely. Lovely it, stuff. It, take, it takes off the hit. Um, so, yeah, so moving on to 2019. This is a collaboration with an Australian electronic band called Flume. Have you heard of Flume before? I have heard of Flume and have several songs saved by Flume. Tell me more about Flume. I know that Flume is Australian and mm-hmm. I had five songs saved by him, two of them with the late great Sophie. Uh, one a collaboration and one a remix of one of her songs from, from her album. Do you know Sophie? I mean, I know Sophie is Baxter. <laughs> <laughs> right, Sophie, capital letters, was... Uh, a pioneering trans lady who 
had an album called Oil of Every Pulse and Insides. Mm -hmm. She was crucial for the um, uh, PC music genre. So she's collaborated a lot with Charlie XCX, but also Arca, but also a million and one other modern pop stars so yeah I, I knew flume in that capacity more more than anything else and um, I, I have to say it's another one of those where i'm like who is flume what are these songs i can't remember the sophie ones i remembered but the other ones i'd saved like two or three from different albums and i was like oh yeah catchy electronic australian man um, so are, are they the kind of band like the chemical brothers who does they collaborate with loads lots, of yeah. lots of collaborations lots of collaboration but but like also lots of kind of standalone albums which is not always the case for kind of mm-hmm. electronic, I mean, D- Diplo, as far as I'm aware, has like one album or something, or like m- maybe maybe more, but it's like usually it's like a single here, an EP there, a collaboration with someone else. It's whereas Flume definitely has more more standalone albums. So tell me, is this musically very much their kind of standard sound? Uh, yes, uh, one of the songs okay. that I have saved will never be like you which is a collaboration with Kai. I don't know who that is, K A I, and it sounds you know not dissimilar. To, to this song because I thought it was interesting that this says London grammar although mm. it's just literally Hannah by herself mm. so it's obviously the name is what they wanted to the most yeah. a bit cheeky but it's interesting isn't it when people choose to do featuring an artist versus featuring sorry featuring a band versus featuring an individual mm. you know like um, obviously we talked to Ben Hampson about the fact that on AA sessions like sometimes it will be Blood Red Shoes but it's only Stephen or clear drop and it's only the the vocalist and they deliberately kind of only pick one person from each band right uh whereas other times yeah you you've got the whole band for the name and uh and that's it well you, you don't know like uh, did you look at the credits could they have co-written it or yeah no i, I looked at it and it's, it's, it's co-written by flume and hannah reed so all right there we go it is um but yeah so for me it was like some sort of like mad instrumentation which mm-hmm. kind of works from flume um and then her usual vocals although it has a really nice middle eight when she changes her vocal style but then she checks it back again and i wish mm. she changed her style of singing more because i think she can she has a, a quite a dynamic voice and be interesting to hear her do other things i think later on on this playlist you do hear her sing different things quite kind of like um i put here it's crying out for a remix mm. a more up-tempo again remix um but yeah this is i think hannah reads also collaborate with disclosure so she does mm. kind of you know she does get around with her with her vocals without her, her other band members but mm. um yeah i thought it was it was decent but i thought it's interesting to see her away from her usual band what do you think so i think my favorite part of the song was the really jarring synths mm. I, I thought okay this this is flumey but i didn't expect to see that with with the vocals but as with i have to say a few quite a few of these songs i thought it was fine but I had no real desire to listen to it more than twice. You know, like uh, I think I think Flume's done better, and I think London Grammar have done better. <laughs> uh, I could I could agree with you once again that a more up tempo. I'm surprised to hear you talking so much about remixes, but there there we go. Yeah, I, I I agree with you on that. I don't think I usually would do, but because of the previous remix album, I know that it's it works for them. Like, mm. so I'm surprised they haven't done it more often. So moving on to the next track, which is called Hell to the Lies from. 2017 from their second album and i discovered this while doing pilates <laughs> which i'm sure many london grammar fans may have also done <laughs> oh you listen to music when you do pilates or you yeah yeah of pilates. course yeah i thought it'd just be the sound of creaky bones and grunts <laughs> and farts yeah <laughs> and I, I remember like once in like um, one of my pilates teachers i put on like um shuffle and uh, fuck the police came on <laughs> And I was there going, like, <laughs> how long is she going to wait? It's going to get worse. Incredible. This plays some Pilates. And at the start, it's like, oh, okay, here we go. This is the second album sound of London Grammar, which is basically pretty similar to the first album. But the last, like, two minutes, it changes. And it, for me, it's fucking beautiful. What I, didn't, <laughs> what I do find interesting is, like, when you are looking at YouTube, every single person will comment this band's underrated like yeah. it could it could be the Rolling Stones someone goes oh my god this band's so underrated I guess it depends where you're from right like I I imagine in the UK absolutely not but probably anywhere else they're not a household name but um yeah I, I 
I really do like the song. Main and it's because of the ending. I think the ending's beautiful. And I watched them do it live on um, Radio 1 and they cut off the ending. I was like, what? what? How yeah. dare you? How dare you, Radio 1? Have you seen this? There's a film with Tom Cruise called Oblivion. I have not the, seen it. The soundtrack's by M83. Okay. And it's thrilling. And the strings remind me of that soundtrack. So check it out if you've not heard it. But what are your thoughts? Well, my thought at the beginning, because when, when we write stuff out, um, well, when I take notes, I always write out the album titles. They have really bland album titles. I'm judging them for that. So uh, <laughs> if you wait, truth is a beautiful thing, Californian soil. I'm like, I, I don't know, it's, it's a bit cliched. Hell Would to you the- prefer the 1975 approach? Um, yes, Would as you- long as you can <laughs> abbreviate it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I prefer the Sigur Roth approach of... I made up my not be- Yeah, not being able to fucking say what it is. <laughs> So obviously this was a quieter song, so I, I always worry when it's a quieter Uh-oh. song of like, yeah. oh oh god, am I gonna am I gonna listen? And on first listen, I thought it was nice, but it didn't stick with me. But on the second listen, I really appreciated how it built, decided I liked it and save it, as you say, because of the ending. Mm. And mm. I think yeah, London grammar do that a lot. I mean, I haven't really analyzed the song structure or kind of the layers of instrumentation, but they do often take it in directions that you're not expecting. And and I, I really like the way it built. And I, you know, I've listened to it since kind of taking these notes and I'm like, yeah, this, this is definitely a good song. So, so yeah, I think my, my favorite so far unexpectedly for a, for a quieter song. Um, and then moving on to a more recent track with America, which I believe was kind of cathartic for Hannah Reed. I think mm. she was thinking about leaving the music industry. Yes. Um, she wasn't comfortable. She found it um, sexist, and she didn't, she's also suffering um, with some ill health as well. Mm-hmm. And then I believe that she wrote this about you know uh, traveling around the world, and she played it to her band, and they added to it. And she thought, actually, okay, I feel like we can continue. And they made an album mm-hmm. called California Soil. Dirt Soil. Mm-hmm. It's not a favorite for me. But I believe that the London Grammar fans adore it. But so, what are your thoughts? I really like the lyrics. Uh, mm. Obviously, America is a metaphor. You know, it, it's a, it's of course about a band being big in America. But it seemed very obvious to me as as you know, your what are you trying to get out of being a famous musician and and what's good and and what's not bad. And yeah, I, I found it very interesting to to read about what Hannah said about the theme. So she said. This record is about gaining possession of my own life. You imagine success will be amazing. Then you see it from the inside and ask, why am I not controlling this thing? Why am I not allowed to be in control of it? And does that connect in any way to being a woman? And I thought it was really nice that she could channel her frustrations into her music and that her bandmates basically said, like, it's very much about her experience and we wanted that message to come through loud loud and clear. So kudos, kudos to her. And I'm, I'm glad that she continues because, yeah, I can only imagine how many women have been put off by by the music industry. But when it comes to to the song, yeah, this this was another one that I thought was fine. I, I liked the, I've written affected guitar. Don't really know what I mean anymore, to be honest, Fran. Um, but it didn't musically stick with me very much. On to the next track, which is Nightcrawl, which is a cover from... Kavinsky and Love, featuring Lovebox from CSS. And that's from the film Drive, and this is the cover. Um, have you heard the original? Of course, I have seen. I have seen Drive at the cinema. And uh, yeah, so I wasn't aware they did this because obviously it's a long time since Drive came out. And I know that like um, Zane Lowe years ago asked those bands to cover the Drive soundtrack, oh. and he did it. Yeah, so he got like Night Singing Fires, and those are like big bands. So it's kind of weird that that happened and then they've also done this themselves mm. but yeah this is uh 2013 it's kind of sinister although i do prefer the originals synth arpeggios to the piano i think it's missing that i think if it's dropped over and had more synths i think it would work yes uh, hannah's voice works really well with it but i just missed that synth arpeggio from the original for me how about you yes i think they've definitely made it their own mm. but it doesn't really add to it because again, it's kind of p- piano with hints of guitar and a little bit of percussion, but it doesn't create the same atmosphere. Mm. The exception is the kind of trip hop drums, which come in for the, for the last section and, you know, mixes it up and her vocals are kind of doing different things to the original, but it didn't, 
it didn't do enough for it to for it to be like an excellent cover for me I'm, I'm glad I listened to it and I think I realized that they done a, a cover of Night, Night Call and I was like oh I hope Franz put this on the list so I'm glad that you did so I had a chance to listen to it but uh, I I do think go and check out the original as a, a trip hop fan mm-hmm. do you see any resemblance uh, I think there's definitely some uh, some percussive elements which sound trip hoppy. And actually, it's funny you say that because in 2013 they did some early recordings with Liam Howe from Sneaker Pimps and also Rolo from Faithless. So clearly, I think there's there's some some influences there. Even though I would not categorize them as a, as a trip hop band, but definitely a lot of the songs on on this uh, this playlist have trip hop elements. So moving back to more recent times, we have how does it feel? Uh, so this. Is when I said her voice changes. So this mm. is probably the closest to a modern pop song for me. It's more upbeat. It's, you can you can hear a bass and it's got like a disco drum beat to it. And like this could be sung by maybe Anne Marie or Ellie Golding. You know, like I think this could be yeah. And it's interesting to see that they have this. Um, although this was co-written by her production team, which may be why it's slightly different oh, to okay. the other other tracks. Yeah, I, I actually really enjoyed this on the surprise. I hadn't heard it before. Yeah, I forgot to mention that I thought it interesting on their second album that Paul Epworth and Greg Kirsten were there. So you're mm. saying there's another production team for this album? Yep. Okay. Uh, so the I didn't write down Anne-Marie and Annie Golding. What I wrote down is Hyman, Calvin Harris. You know that song, Pray to God? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It really it really reminded me of that. I do think Pray to God is, is better. And it's I'm, I'm really matching you today because I wrote, this is the first song where... where it feels like a pop behemoth of a track and really made me understand why they're so big because I'm like, this This sounds like, you know, strongly produced pop du jour. Also reminded me, you know, the chorus of Daft Punk with Nile Rodgers. But yeah, it's kind of the opposite to Baby It's You. I only really like the chorus of this song. I, I thought the, the verses were a bit forgettable. But I was just surprised I'd not heard it because, yeah, it, it mm. sounds like it should be, you know. I mean, this song went to number one, right? Yeah, but then, but, but then you look at the singles and they don't seem to go anywhere, really. I think mm. it's like everyone's buys the album, but that's kind of a, that's kind of it. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so I yeah, it's nice to hear that 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 sound of them. And then moving back to the the, the sophomore album with a big picture. Um, again, I had never heard of this until I did the research. Um, it's got a lovely guitar riff. Um, it reminds me of a German band called Hearts. Uh, check out the debut album. You mentioned, I've mentioned before. It before. Yeah. Um, yeah, to sound pretentious, uh, this sounds like uh, a victim breaking free of the chains and running away. <laughs> or from the lyrics or from the atmosphere? Well, that's just that, the atmosphere of it. You can imagine, like, you know, in a film, that would be the scene. And I want to grab their hand and wonder them. Because uh, I, I, I love this. And uh, reading YouTube as I do. <laughs> some, <laughs> I love some, some people read encyclopedias. You read YouTube. Some, some lunatic has written, after Peter Gabriel... I thought there would be no more music for me to listen to. <laughs> and I don't know if that's a criticism to Peter Gabriel. Destroying no. music. Destroying music. <laughs> <laughs> ah, he ruined it for me. But th- that's it. Again, going back, I-, I feel like London Grammar, Church's Wolf Alice are liked by older music fans mm. who don't know much other modern music. That mm. That is the profile that i would put them under and i'm sure the numbers kind of reflect that yeah, yeah well a bit of that and a bit of not because like, yeah, i saw they have like 2.9 million monthly spotify listens something like that enormous so yeah that doesn't surprise me but as a peter gabriel fan i really enjoyed this mainly because of, of the guitar which you don't hear enough of i think in the other songs well fran this is where we oh, deviate no. yeah oh, no. <laughs> yeah we, we've been agreeing so nicely uh another slow one and I thought, oh no, I think this is going to be a bad slow one. And I've written the U2 slash Toto guitars, not adding much there. And this is easily the blandest song on the list. <laughs> hey, speak, speaking of Coldplay. But... <laughs> yeah, no, I really, I listened to it again just before recording. And I was like, yeah, I really, yeah, definitely one of my least. Yeah, I think, yeah, my least favorite from, from the playlist, unfortunately. So uh, going back to the debut, and this is solely written by Hannah. Um, oh. piano cool. and lyrics it's a song that she gets anxious about singing because it's, it's so personal to her mm-hmm. and sometimes she can't breathe while singing mm. which is, which, um, but yeah this could be maybe Adele it could work for Adele um, although it obviously has simps instead of strings mm. I quite enjoy the gentle guitar that joins it near the end and gives it some warm elements so 
it's you know it's it's late night bath time music. <laughs> Beautiful. Is that a CD compilation? Yeah, that's you should you should make that playlist. I thought this was one of the better ones, but I didn't save it. Is mm-hmm. is what I thought. I got running up that hill vibes oh, okay. from it, and it's interesting what you say about her being anxious because this song more than any others, I was like. Her voice is amazing, but she's not letting go. She's really not letting go. Like you can feel that like, I don't really know how to describe it. It's like her voice is strong, but emotionally it's not. She's holding back. And given that this is from 2013, I imagine this is, I was going to say, I imagine this is way better live, but maybe, Mm. yeah, it is so personal that maybe you have to catch Hannah at the right moment to kind of really hearing her letting go. So yeah, this is why it's always interesting to know the, the background to music. And also yeah. maybe her first time in a studio. Yeah. She didn't know how to you know how to react and to give her best self. Yeah. So maybe they'd seem can we record it later one? Yeah. And then finishing with Lord It's a Feeling, the orchestral version. Mm-hmm. Very classy of you, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's kind of rare in the modern era to have or- orchestras with bands because there's no money mm-hmm. in production anymore. <laughs> so, you know, it's not the 90s when Buddy and Brayson said something could have an orchestra of anything. Mm-hmm. I saw um, a James Bond film last night, uh, Casino Royale. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you want an audition for a Bond theme. Yes, yes, I, I wrote exactly that. And also, it's kind of unexpected to have f bombs. Yeah. Um, and she mentions, I think, said, "Oh, you know, I did it on purpose as a f you to the music industry that you know a nice middle class lady mm-hmm. can have co- controversial lyrics, and that's fine." Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a nice contrast. I yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed that song. Lord, it's a feeling is the song that I'd saved. Um, ah. So I knew the original, and I've kind of got notes on the original versus the the orchestral one. So. I think the original version has strong Martha Gunn vibes more than any other song. So if you really like this song, I, I really, I really do recommend checking them out. And I really, I really like her vocals. I really like the fuck somebody else because it, it kind of hits you in the face unexpectedly each time. And this version, wow, like the orchestra really, really adds to the song. And the be- like in different phases, I, I had like comments on the strings in different parts. So the beginning reminded me of the orchestra that's on the Hidden album by these new Puritans. I don't know if you're... I know the first album. I saw them live a couple of times. They used to support Sea Power quite often. We need, we need to do a these new Puritans okay. uh, because they're a very weird and interesting band and, and yeah, I'm a big fan. So yeah, the beginning reminded me of, of the kinds of songs on, on Hidden by these new Puritans. Then by the second chorus, James Bond. Then Evil Horns, which I, which I, really, <laughs> I really enjoyed. Uh, yeah, it really, it really elevates it. And it's funny because... I re-listened to Lord It's a Feeling before listening to the orchestra version. And I was like, okay, I can I can see why I've saved it, but I can also see why I haven't come back to it. Then listening to the orchestra version, I was like, whoa, this this definitely adds to it. And I think more than any other song on re-listen, my fucking God, does it get stuck in your head? It really, really gets stuck in your head in a positive way, I would say. So yeah, I think this is this is my favorite from the list and a great closer. So thank you, Fran. I think they've done other songs from the album orchestrally, so give it a go. Mm. So I wonder how you heard of it, because I never heard the song before. So March 24th, 2002 is when I saved mm-hmm. this song to okay. my Spotify. I can tell you because I, I looked it up. I wonder if it's Matt from Pick a Disc, because I feel like oh, this really? is exactly the kind of band that he would like. I, I Or, you know, just someone else who I, I follow and post a lot about music. Um, I don't know. I never know because... I really, you know, find music in different ways. You know, as mentioned, shazamming a video of a cat is is one of them. And sometimes, yeah, I know exactly, you know, who recommended it to me or which playlist it's on. Yeah. But with this, I I have no idea. But um, but yeah, God, they're good with an orchestra. Because yeah, I looked and it goes like number seventy five in a singles chart. That's mm. why I was like surprised. Like it's not a bigger hit. Mm. Exactly. So the question we're all wanting to ask is, uh, are they? over or underrated i would say that i'm glad to know more of their tunes i can't deny they have very catchy choruses and i was very surprised to often like their their quieter songs but i think a lot of the songs left me cold i thought they were a bit bland and i thought that hannah's voice carries almost all of the music i also think and i I forgot to mention this i would love to hear her harmonizing with herself or harmonizing with literally anyone else because (laughs) i think that 
that would make it more interesting and build layers that I think their music sorely needs. So given that they also have a huge amount of Spotify followers, as much as I enjoyed some of their songs, especially Lord It's a Feeling, I'm afraid it's overrated for me. I think they're better than I expected because, like, yeah, like, I dismissed them after the first album. So a bit like XX, I, I dismissed them after the first mm. album. And then that one, a I, good I just... overrated band because I also think one or two songs and that's it. And then that one, I discovered actually have some better songs. So mm-hmm. I think maybe they're on a journey and I think that they have maybe a faster album with a different producer mm-hmm. could result in something brilliant because, yeah, I mean... They, 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 I guess they want to maybe keep that original sound and not alienate the fan base, but I feel like they can push forward, add some more elements. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe some yeah more backing vocals, um, some faster BPMs, and to make a decent album. Yeah, so, they're, they're definitely not a band that I'm dismissing mm. at all. They're a band where you know now if a new song came out, I would I would give it a listen. So you've definitely you know improved my my opinion of them, but I you know with with such a huge following I, c- I can't say that they're underrated or you know not overrated because I just I do find quite a lot of their songs bland but I'm sure especially in one or two albums time they will there will be a very strong 10 track playlist we certainly hope so if she doesn't leave the music industry fingers crossed hey podcast lovers now available a new podcast experience featuring exclusive mini series like Food Faves, and all new series that takes a fun look at everyone's real first true love, food. Milky Way Marvels, a lighthearted astronomy series where we explore the fascinating wonders of our galaxy. Pop Culture Icons, an entertaining, nostalgic look back at various nouns in popular culture, plus more. Relax, enjoy, listen, laugh, and maybe even learn. Podcast. Presented by Sonic Embassy. Now streaming everywhere you listen. Access quick links to your favorite places to listen now at solo.to slash Sonic Embassy. Underrated. Welcome back to part two. And I have to say, I'm rather excited to talk about today's underrated act. Fran, you were the one who picked them. You're the one who introduced me to them. Who are they? Well, we are talking about Six by Seven, a indie band from Nottingham, although they are really from Nottingham, um, who formed in 1992 as a five-piece uh, the lead singer, main songwriter is, is Chris Ollie. And then we had um, guitarist Sam Hempton, drummer Chris Davis, bassist Paul Douglas, and keyboard player James Flower. And they existed up until around 2008. And then they said themselves they're sick of playing to 15 to 30 people <laughs> and, and called it a day <laughs> because they're sick of everyone telling them that they used to be bigger than they were. But unfortunately, they did not make any money from good album reviews from the enemy and then um they kept reforming and now i believe i think chris ollie does it himself he's on bank and kickstarter and he is basically six by seven by name although there's not been an actual band for a long time i discovered them around 2002 i remember having posters at university of their third album and i heard the more i, I hear know, about your uni years the more i wish i knew you when you were at uni <laughs> But, it's like, but looking back, it's so fucking weird that we had six by seven posters mm. at uni. Like they were, yeah. This was not Travis. This is kind of like you know a, a kind of niche indie band who are loved by the few. And then I saw I O U Love on MTV, and I instantly loved it. And I forgot about them. Then I went to Seattle. And searching around the uh, secondhand stores, I saw it for two dollars. I thought, yeah, I like that one song. It's probably worth two dollars, and then it turns out that I liked, you know, six or seven songs, and then I started to slowly listen to all the other albums. And then you know they broke up as soon as I got into them, like most of bands course. do. Yeah. Of course, of course, of course. And then yeah, then they they came back and they've toured briefly, but they toured like three locations in the UK, and that's it. So yeah, I've never seen them live, and I've always kind of thought like. Why would this band not give them more of a chance? They've got that dark, shoegaze, basement free kind of sound that's not many people are doing in, in the late 90s. And yeah, I just feel like this band needs a, a, a second wind. And um, this podcast will definitely be their second wind. So, Babs, 
I assume you never heard of them before until recently. So I'd never heard of this band. And when you look it up and you see that they have eight albums, I was like, bloody hell, for it to be kind of an in- English indie band from around the time that I started getting into that kind of music and for me to not have heard of them. Okay, I wasn't living in the UK at the time, but they were touted as the new Radiohead. They were loved by John Peel. They had a deal with Beggar's Banquet. Um, and yet, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't heard of them at all. And when I looked at their Facebook page, their description is, quote, epic post-rock, shapeful melodies, neo kraut and sonic psychedelia. So I was like, okay, well, this could go either way from me. <laughs> like, some stuff I like, shapeful melodies, mm, I, don't, I don't know about that. But given the era and your and your passion from them, I was expecting, I I put something alternative Britpop-esque. I was expecting something that wasn't, let's say, a million miles away from Manson, especially when I saw that they t- toured with the Mannix and, and Dandy mm. Warhols. I was like, yeah, this... This will make sense. But yeah, I, I came in knowing very little. I will say that I think Chris Ollie has a beautiful face. And this is a compliment to both you and someone else, Fran. I think Chris Ollie is the love child of you and season five guest, Mike Lash. And I will let him know. And I hope you both take that as a compliment. So I try something on Photoshop by blending up. Yeah, faces. yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you should. Yeah, I give it okay. Remind me, remind me, dear. When doing research into this band, I was thinking, you know... Uh, you know, I, I will get into my opinions of maybe why this band weren't so big musically, but I think Chris Oddy is a grumpy man. Mm-hmm. The documentary which you sent me, which is called "The Dream is Sweeter Than the Taste," which do you know mm-hmm. what that refers to? Is it like a song? It must be some. It must be some sort of lyric. I don't know. Like I think someone literally says like whenever he was interviewed, it was like pulling teeth kind of thing. Like he, it, it was difficult to make him talk and. Yeah, he is a bit arrogant. Like the way that he talks about the band, it's like, so he says, we wanted to make music that filled the gap in our record collections, right? That didn't, Mm -hmm. but he was like, we didn't want to be Mercury Rev and we didn't want to be, and I'm like, okay, like if you're, if you're immediately being that competent, although it worked for Kasabian, who I will definitely be mentioning again uh, throughout this, uh, this, this section, but maybe he was just a little bit too spiky because as you say, looking at the reviews, like they were a critic's darling, Mm-hmm. But it didn't translate, which is interesting. But again, I think the image isn't great, is it? Also, well, I think he's fit, so I think yeah, but he, he might be. But the band, if you look at the band as a whole in the videos, it wasn't great on the visual thing, and mm-hmm. and it's sad. But obviously, they were in the late nineties. It was still an MTV. But I mold. I do think you know this is I don't know I haven't counted, but so many of the underrated bands that we talk about are from the early noughties. Like, mm. uh, from the late 90s, early noughties, and they're usually rock bands. And I think it was just a particularly bad time if you weren't basically new metal. Uh, because it's it's post-grunge, pre-indie revival. From this playlist, their sound encompasses a lot of different things, which we'll, we'll get into. But I, yeah, I, I think basically, we've already mentioned lots of different factors without even getting into the, the playlist, that they had lots of things working against them, despite, you know, having some interesting music for sure. It's nice discovering them on George Holland, so obviously they had some hair time. Mm. But yeah, I wonder what, I wonder why the, the big push didn't happen. Like, I never ever saw them at festivals at all. Mm. So either they weren't. Could that be the issue as well that they just weren't yeah. touring very much? Were they not? Were they not liked by the promoters? I mean, yeah. So they were just a, a band who just seemed to exist, and it was only until recently I even really knew what they looked like. So mm. They they just were face of sound six by seven who had like a few killer singles um watching the documentary i, I discovered they had a, a six music campaign mm. in 2017 trying to get eat junk to number one mm-hmm. which then the band reformed i think they played glastonbury so they can't keep having oh, wow. like spikes of spikes of popularity and then it sort of like vanishes again i don't know when the documentary is from but the fact that the it's not just chris speaking on the documentary so clearly yeah. there's not animosity or th- there's maybe not much animosity which I means think it's post I think it's post that campaign so it must be 2017 yeah which is why they had just recently got back together yeah uh, we, we can go we can go into it so yeah let's yeah. do it uh, track one I chose another love song because I think it's probably the best introduction to the, to their music it's more of a dancey track than, than before it's, it's it has the elements of their previous tracks with like their chainsaw guitar and the, the droning organ sound. But Chris's vocals are more hushed in this, while in, in, in his more angry, punky 6x7 songs. It's got this brooding menace. And then 
out of nowhere, you get this orchestration and some drum and bass rhythms, and it like smashes into a, a whole new track. It's to me, it sounds a bit like Orbital meet My Bloody My Bloody Valentine. Yeah, and and it, it could be a perfect opening to a film. And if I ever do make a film, I will have this as my opening song. <laughs> you heard it here first, the lads and madits. And... So yeah, so what's your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I will read you my notes as you know as I was typing and I was listening. Oh, nice urgent bassline and mystical effects guitars to start. There's some strings. There's some totally unexpected rave breakbeats. Whoa. <laughs> I loved this. I really, really loved this. Um, and I was trying to kind of classify it because I was like, what is this? There's definitely big beat elements. Mm. You know, I don't think it's a million miles away from, you know, similar era, maybe Chemical Brothers and stuff. But it's it adds so many different elements all working together so difficult to classify and and yeah i got echoes of primal scream and Kasabian from here that i wasn't expecting but yeah i, I thought this was indeed a great introduction and uh, as per usual with songs list, surprised that you like this so much but i think yeah you are maybe more of a raver than i give you credit for <laughs> so yeah i do wonder leicester isn't so far from nottingham mm. i wonder serge had heard this track because there are some similarities oh aren't there? we're gonna be bringing up Kasabian oh, right. multiple times <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, to my second song, which also could be another opening track with uh, So Close. Um, this album was basically recorded live with no overdubs. Oh, wow. So it's basically like listening to a live album. Um, and yeah, his vocal was a ton of one take. Wow, is, that's yeah. very impressive. Again, is that arrogance or is that, you know, just brave <laughs> way? Yeah. or is it cheap? Who knows what, what, what it could be. I like how he keeps repeating the same phrases um, and I love his, his throaty vocals. But is it missing an end, is my question to you. Well, I don't think it is, because I like no. this even more than uh, oh. Another Love Song. I love this, like, a moody piano and a stressful synth going on at the same time. Then the vocals come in, and I just love the way the tension builds in this song. It never lets up. You're constantly kind of on edge, and it really comes into its own when the guitar comes in. So, again, kind of almost the opposite to London Grammar, where it's like they are using... A lot of different albums, uh, a lot of different elements, and the way that it, it builds, I'm I'm on the edge. I'm on tender hooks. I I'm switched on, and I I want to find out what's going to happen. Yeah, no, uh, this was possibly my favorite from the playlist, oh, or, wow. or one of my favorites. I I absolutely loved it because it's kind of like I keep thinking, oh, that's going to be like a drop because mm. it's like cli- it's like climbing. Isn't but it? that's ding, kind of ding, why ding, I like ding, like ding. I kind of like that there isn't mm. because you just I mean yeah it's very anxiety inducing. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way <laughs> so yeah 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 it, it, it has that menace and i guess yeah maybe the young data were thinking oh is it going to suddenly change and doesn't is is kind of the surprise um so yeah so with a a quick change to so the fourth album i believe it's called four and yeah it's called um Bochum, and um the band down to three piece which is why there's less like layer guitars mm. so it's got more electronics it's got like a more of a it's got an arpeggio guitar throughout it's almost Coldplay Stadium at some points. That is quite anthemic, mm-hmm. which is, you know, which you know, I wasn't expecting when I first came across this. It's got a beautiful galloping drum track all the way through it. And I think, yeah, it's one of the best songs of the fourth album, if not the best song of the fourth album, which, like a lot of her albums, I, would, I always love four or five songs, but... To me, they've not made a complete album. They've not made an okay computer. Mm. So they're definitely, for me, a playlist uh, composing that uh, band. So what are your thoughts? So this one, you know, after being absolutely enthralled by the first two, this one I, I didn't enjoy so much. I thought because, yeah, those shapeful melodies uh, are coming mm. in. I appreciated the combination of I've put muscular and synthy guitars. There's definitely, you know, something interesting going on there. And I've put that it reminded me a bit of Kent, a bit of The Verve, and maybe the edges of something shoegazier like slow dive. So yeah, I think like you were saying with my bloody Valentine and, and Orbital, and I've got my bloody mm. Valentine on a on a later track. They're definitely doing something that very few bands are doing, uh, especially at the time. So I could appreciate it for that. And yeah, I found it on a maxi single because Bochum is a place in Germany that I haven't been to, but I know that um, a friend of mine studied there. And the maxi single that I found, they have it's like a bunch of different songs all the songs apart from one called there's a ghost have the name of a place or a a, a day of the week and they have one called Dur, which is this kind of party festival in belgium so okay 
like clearly this this song has had a lot of lives and it is in a lot of different places <laughs> which is interesting but uh yeah i i i didn't enjoy it anywhere near as much as so close in another love song it's kind of strange that you know i guess although the band were constantly breaking up they seem to be less angry by mm. this time the, the aggression has been stripped away but again that does happen. Who, who knows? maybe got, and he got old he couldn't be bothered anymore yeah. but um yeah it's, but that's it's a different side to them so going back to the start mm. this is candlelight and uh from their debut album and this is a very much of a 90s sound i mean i would say this sounds like the charlatans to me um it's got that up front drum beat it's got that swirling riff but i do enjoy the ending breakdown that's like a frantic end to it and it's yeah, I mean, this could be a hit single, I think, in the 90s. I'm surprised I literally had never heard of this until the mid noughties <laughs> So this was the kind of song I was expecting for them. Mm. I've written that it's Britpop with something extra. I actually put Ocean Colour Scene rather than oh, the yeah. Because of the, ba- the bass. No, 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 the, in a good way, with the driving bass. But I think because of the organ as well, I said the charlatans. Yeah. But Ocean Colour Scene is never cool. For- but hey. Uh, I, whoa, whoa. I think whoa. Uh, someone might whoa. have a, a beef with you about that. <laughs> And what I haven't mentioned yet is, yeah, he's, he's got an incredibly versatile voice. And here it sounds exactly like Sergio Pizzorno from Kasabian. I mean, you could tell me this is a naughty Kasabian song and I would believe it. Um, <laughs> and I think, yeah, it was one that I didn't like it on first listen, but on second listen, I, I did. Um, I think, again, I was still kind of chasing the high of the first two songs from the album. But I was like, OK, I think you just have to accept that, like, every single song is going to sound totally different and... And just go with it. And yeah, when I listened to it a second time, kind of without those expectations, I, I enjoyed it much more and saved it. Does it sound dated? I think it sounds a little bit dated, maybe. The beginning sounds a little bit dated. Mm. Like I said, a Kasabian naughty song, not a not a recent one. But, I, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing because I, I do like that sound. It's interesting. I, of course, you've probably heard quite a lot of interviews with uh, Serge. He's never mentioned this band, has he? No, no. I, I literally, this morning, listened to him on Rock and Tours, um, oh, really? and he did not mention them. No. So moving on to uh, track five and yeah, to probably the most known song. And as Chris says in like all the time, it's a song that everyone knows, but it doesn't sound anything like six by seven. Like it was literally, they got drunk. They thought let's, let's do a punk song. And this, this came out of it. And that was it. It was a throwaway punk song. And then suddenly this became like the most known song. And they got a bit frustrated because like they thought they're a dark Pink Floyd so when you see them live, they want to be moody and have like eight minute long songs. They're not a, a punk band, although they do have elements. And so that's why the band, I think, feel a bit hurt by this because when people are going to see them live, it was not 20 of its, of 20 um, eat junk. Mm. Although, yeah, I mean, I think it's a classic uh, angry pop song. And the video is shit, but the song. <laughs> The song is brilliant, and I can listen to it again and again and again. Save the nation. I um, messaged Fran, being like, is it worth me spending the time watching the music videos? And he was basically <laughs> like, no. So I didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I read that quote as well, where he was like, we thought we were like Pink Floyd. We thought we were art. <laughs> and then we used to go and do these loud, fast, almost punk songs because it's fun. Now it's become one of those things that might the sound of the band. So it's basically their song too, right? Of like a, yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah. A, throw, a throwaway song. I think it's a great song. And I think this sounds exactly like a saving this is switch space smiles without the ooze honestly i could not believe it uh how how much it, it sounded like it but yeah i think it's punk with melodic sensibilities and obviously you know, the catchy title of eat junk become junk i don't know uh it reminded me of a, a more modern version <laughs> have you heard of bob Vi- bob villain no, no no bob villain has a song called health is wealth <laughs> <laughs> and and it, I, I felt like it was the very much the 21st version because eat junk become junk it sounds like yeah fucking Americans with their junk food blah 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 Bob Villain health as well it's literally like I was killing myself till I realized danger brain heart liver and lungs can hit failure now seasoned dal and veg with fresh herbs cut caffeine because it messed with nerves uh, drink water for the body's natural power but water from taps can taste sour etc <laughs> etc et <laughs> no fresh produce but we've got it's basically like this commentary of like you know, especially kind of in, in poorer communities, people eat junk food and that's really bad and you should you should look after yourself. And that's like, that's a very sophisticated and very political song. This is, now listen to this. If you eat junk, you become <laughs> junk. 
Uh, and I mean, I like both songs, but for, for different reasons, uh, is what I would say. If you are listening to this and you've not heard them before, this may be the first song to try, but be aware that you won't hear this again. But again, again I, I, I haven't mentioned it yet because I think that's what we're going to come back to, but I think this is the problem. The, prob- the problem is, like, every single song so far has been very different. Uh, and they're very difficult to categorize and they get prissy when they get categorized <laughs> into one of their sounds. Well, if you're going to be like that, you know, I, I, I don't know, like I, I'm not really an artist of any kind, but surely you have to accept at some point, you know, especially the bigger you become, that the the art that you make then takes on a life beyond you. And, you know, if you make a song that people enjoy, sure, it's frustrating that people aren't into it as much as uh, your progier songs but it's a good song people enjoy it kind of appreciate it no am i being too uh simple yeah it's, it's not exactly like tequila with television <laughs> i mean it's like it's not embarrassing it's, it's not like a, a like catchy a song pun. take but it yeah, back <laughs> yeah, yeah but like, it's, like, it's not it's not it's not a song you can dismiss for being silly because mm. no so yeah it's a bit frustrating and again yeah you've got a point you know because they kept changing per album the, per- the people who like the sound of the first album might got pissed off. It reminded me of Jules. And so forth. It reminded me yeah, of Jules. That's yeah. what I was thinking when when I was listening to this. It's like that's this is another band from a part of the UK that's not necessarily known for music. Doesn't have as big a an A and R scene. And uh, and look what's happened again. It's happened again. Anyway. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, 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 that's the name of the song. Sorry, it's a horrible <laughs> segue. Oh. Yeah, so this is back to the third album. Um, the, is it the way, way, way it is, or way it the was? way I feel today. The way I feel today. Um, so I think it's probably the best album. Um, so yeah, Chris does like to keep repeating the, the same phrases and the same sequences, uh, which we have with this. It's a theme for the band. Um, but this, although it's repetitive, for me it's not tiresome. Um, it's got some weird odd complexities and the creeping organ um and each 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 uh, verse uh creates a new sonic wave of joy if that is a phrase i can use you you are allowed tick thank you, you very much allowed. what's your thoughts so my thoughts are that it's very difficult to believe this is from the same album it's so close like it sounds like mm. a totally different band and again could this be the issue with their lack of success i uh, I liked this. It wasn't one of my favorites, let's say, but I enjoyed how it sounds like a less woozy My Bloody Valentine. Here's here's where I put it. <laughs> it it's like a, a more bass oriented, less shimmery My Bloody Valentine, and, and obviously much shorter. As this playlist goes on, I am continually amazed by the the variety and the textures to their to their music. I mean, the three singles from the album, I love. Um, I think so close, and a song called um, "My New Friends," which is an acoustic Neil Young song. God. And there you go; you've got three completely different songs. Yeah, wow. It's kind of, in a way, their own fault, maybe. Uh, pushing to 2013, with I think their second comeback, um, with "Crying," when they became a free piece, and then they added a former placebo drummer Steve Hewitt. Oh. Yes. On the drums there. Oh my god! Then maybe I have heard of Six by Seven from reading his Wikipedia page, but just never bothered to explore where he'd gone to. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, of course. I don't know. If, I don't know the link because I don't know if they ever hmm. supported Placebo. And Steve Hewitt's so, American yeah. as well, so that's interesting. Yeah. His drumming is all over this album. He's a very good oh, he's he's, an, he's one of the best. Like, uh, and yeah. they showcase it as much as possible, including this. Um, so this is probably the most, one of the most commercial songs for a long time. It actually has a chorus. I can imagine this. <laughs> I can imagine this being on Radio X. Yeah. Um, it reminds me a little bit of a, of Doves, mm. um, especially with that guitar sound and the drumming. Um, but I I assume it was not given any promotion at all. So the album kind of died. And yeah, I think this is the last proper band album he did before he does the, the things but all by himself so i think it may be a bit too commercial for you what your thoughts uh, yes it is i okay. i i've put that it sounds like the killers which is usually not really? a good thing yeah 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 that was that was the the and i've put unsurprised because it's from 2013 the album, yeah. right um and i can appreciate that the sounds evolved but i don't really like the direction here because i i think so far you know, as as much as you know, they're a bit pretentious for saying it. Yeah, they they haven't sounded like much else of what was going on. Like, yeah, I've compared them to 
to one or two other bands, but it's definitely kind of taking elements of rather than than copying for sure. Maybe maybe Primal Scream. I'd have to look at timelines for Primal Scream because there's there's definite similarities Exterminate there. Exterminators two thousand. That's quite similar. Yeah. So so yeah. Maybe maybe influences there. Um, but I do agree. This is a much poppier song, but that makes it less predictable, and that's why I don't like it as much because almost every song so far, even um, Candlelight, which definitely sounds a bit more commercial and a bit more you know, let's say standardy Britpop, it then still takes a direction that you're not expecting. And I didn't really get that from Crank. So I, I would say maybe this is my least favourite on the on the playlist. On the actual album, most songs are eight minutes long. So it's like he's thought, I could probably do one single right. maybe. Okay. Well, I, I wanted to ask you because, I mean, you put songs from maybe four albums? I think if I think this is over five and a half albums. Five, okay. But yeah, uh, yeah. Is there a reason why kind of you picked, you know, is it... Like, have you have you listened to them? Have you put you know your favorite more from your favorite albums? What was the process? So the first four I one to Cabana CD. Okay. Um, after that, they brought like uh, like a an odds and sods album. So they this is the next song, which is what he had left over from the band, mm-hmm. and then he did uh, an album that I think is on Spotify, mm-hmm. and I don't think I've ever heard it from two thousand and eight, which is the last official breakup album, right? And then they did another compilation of like random stuff, and then this album um, is it Love and Peace? What this Love and Peace and Sympathy? And, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was probably their first proper album for five years, but for me, their first album since oh four. Mm-hmm. Wow, yeah. And then, and then, yeah, all the other albums are on like Bandcamp, and it's got a couple on Spotify, but for me, but it's Chris solo. It doesn't sound like the band at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so. For me, they probably made five albums official, mm-hmm. as I know, know but about. I'm still glad that you put, you know, mm. this more recent song. Next song is Clouds. Um, so yeah, it's from the uh, the Odds and Sods album. Which I thought it was from the Left Luggage at the Peveril Hotel album. Yeah, yeah, but it's not an album. It's the uh, it's it's the leftover stuff from the fourth album. Oh, okay. So I thought the album was literally called Odds and Sods. Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, yeah, no, 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 it's like, that's, that's what it's called, Left Luggage. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking that's, as much as Love and Peace and Sympathy is a boring album title, this is a, a very good album title. I want to know what the Peveril Hotel is. So yeah, so the album I haven't really heard is, uh, yeah, Artist Cannibal's Perch Feast, 2005, I, and um, A Symptom Persist, Kill Your Doctor, 2007. Mm-hmm. They're not, not on Spotify. I can't, I don't think I've even ever heard them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Left Luggage, although it's an odds and sods, it's actually got a lot of decent stuff in it. Uh, I would say it's got more songs I, I enjoy than 04. Um, but yeah, uh, this song, um, maybe it didn't fit the more electronic style because it's from the same album as, as, as Bokum. Um, it's, it's got more of an anthemic sound to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I love the the melodic chorus and I love the false ending and the surprise guitar solo. Yeah, so I didn't put melodic to not, you know, constantly be saying the same thing. I, I But I, I thought the guitar and keyboard or whatever is making that note at the beginning of each bar. Mm. That sounds really great. And I really, really like the verses. But the chorus is a bit too hands in the air stadium rock for me. And I don't think the guitar solo works very well, <laughs> unfortunately. Ah. Uh. I would say, as a given, I'm not usually a fan of noodling. And I think here it sounds like noodling, right? Like it sounds a bit like, oh, fuck it, let's chuck it in. Whereas almost every other song so far, it seems so much more measured. Uh, whereas, yeah, I, I personally think the, the guitar solo is a, bit, is a bit chucked in here. So moving on to the other semi-known song, which is I Owe You Love, spelled in the Prince way. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, this is a song that's, that started for me. Although in recent times, I have discovered that this is kind of ripping off a song by the church called Under the Milky Way. Oh, I've heard of that song, but I don't I know have, what it sounds I like. I have now heard it, and it's like, oh, shit. Because mm. it has kind of tainted it for me, although this is very much in the 6x7 style. Um, it's kind of weird because this has a keyboard riff, which I don't know any other song that has a, a keyboard motif all the way through. It's a dark pop song. It's moody, and I... I, I used to love it when I was 21 years old. What are your thoughts? Well, I am 35 now and I really love this. Again, we're on song nine of this playlist mm-hmm. and it's a totally different sound with totally different vocals. There's a kind of simple bass line, but it adds this kind of melancholic layer to the song. There's a kind of more synthy piano 
And yeah, on the first listen, I was like, oh, I think the chorus lets it down. But again, like with, you know, London Grammar on other songs, I think the way that it ends redeems it and ultimately saves it. And on the second listen, knowing that that's coming, I, I enjoyed the chorus a lot more. So I did, I did save this in the end. But I, I just, yeah, making my way through this playlist, I was just like, I cannot believe they sound like so many different acts like it's it's I'm it's very impressed like clearly you know they don't rest <laughs> they don't rest they they're always working I mean and reading about Chris Soddy as well where I, I don't think it exists anymore but he's basically managed to carve out a career as a working musician he set up this thing called the music club and by setting stuff on Bandcamp he was saying like yeah I make like 60 grand a year or something like that and he's like you know my, the way he was talking about his fans seems quite genuine in the documentary. He's like, I, you know, it's the cliche of like, I don't see them as fans and see them as family. But with him, I can really believe it because I think he has kind of deep contact with them and he's constantly making like special CDs and, and, and other things. And, and yeah, I think once again, I, I'm, I'm just yeah, deeply impressed by this band. It's also mad to think, yeah, this would have been done live with no, no overdubs. Unreal. Yeah, so then I thought, how do I finish off the playlist? And I know you love a long song. This is, I think this is how they finished Method of the Gigs. It's called Oh Dear. And yeah, they keep mentioning Pink Floyd. And this is kind of like dirty uh, Pink Floyd prog rock, you know, but written in a bedsit rather than in a mansion. <laughs> rather than in a mansion, I, I can imagine. It's moody. Uh, it teases an ending. It's got this throbbing hypnotic bass all the way through. And then at the end, you get like the chaos and you get like, yeah, that shoe gaze on my bloody Valentine guitar. And it's really, really works for a life. On, I think it's on George Holland, like a cut, a five and a half minute version rather than the normal eight and a half minute version. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, yeah, this to me, I guess, is what Chris thinks of, of six by seven sound is. Yeah, you know, you put a song that's seven minutes 32, but unlike Sea Power, I, you know, I didn't notice it because I enjoyed this song so much. Again, last song, different guitar, different vocals. He keeps shifting mm. and changing. Okay, the synthy organ piano is still here and that's that's in other songs, but his voice is more exposed, I would say, and that it sounds great. And I wrote that because there's this kind of organ guitar solo sound, and because it's the last song of the playlist, it actually reminded me of Megalomania by Muse. <laughs> um, and although it's a bit more melodic than I normally like, it switches and turns in so many different ways. Like you say, you don't know when it's going to end. And I've, I've listened to it three times now. I, I'm getting something out of it every time. And yeah, I'm going to continue listening to it because I'm sure there's there's much to discover. Uh, yeah, a great closer. Congratulations, Fran. Really, like, I think maybe... My favourite underrated playlist that you've uh, you've created. Blimey, John. And you didn't even like half the songs. Uh, but I mean, <laughs> no, I didn't like... I, I I kind of really didn't like two of the songs. Like, uh, I think, yeah, Crying in Clouds. I re- Those I kind of didn't like. But I saved six songs from, from this playlist, which I think might be a record. Maybe in Japan it was... It was similar and opening with another love song and so close, like that got me in straight away. Um, so yeah, a really, really great playlist. So definitely listen to the first three albums. Mm-hmm. I will do for sure. It's a shame I've not seen them live. I, I doubt I will. You never know. Something, unless you unless never something know. Magical, magical happens. But it was nice that for, you know, for two weeks, I was in touch with Chris mm-hmm. and he seemed lovely to me. Aww, that's nice. <laughs> Thank you, Chris Ollie, for doing my fancy album feature. And yeah, it's just nice to be able to talk about a band I've probably not really spoken about for twenty years. Wow. <laughs> I've never never met anybody else who knew this band or anything. Um so it's nice that they got some sort of small community on online who are still supporting uh Chris as much as possible. So thank you for listening, Babs. Yeah. And of course, I'm gonna say that they're totally underrated. A pitiful two thousand five hundred monthly listeners. That Dude, is fuck. that is unacceptable. Uh, so I I hope that we guide some people towards six by seven. Um, yeah, I think of of the bands that you've picked as underrated, Fran, the most deserving of uh, uh, of guiding uh, new people towards there. But I, I think we've listed lots of reasons why um, mm. why why they maybe didn't make it as big. And and you know if you're interested in them, definitely watch their documentary and, and people talk about that, including people at Beggars Banquet who loved them and they said like, oh, it was really awful actually because you know, you had this feeling of like, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and it, it didn't quite happen. But um, there was a very interesting Pop Matters interview from 2017. I don't I don't know if you read that one. 
Um, but yeah, they 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 put it very uh, beautifully lyrically. They they say maybe the band's output was too heterogeneous. I never know how to pronounce that word for for easy digesting, which I think is definitely true. Mm. Again, similar to Japan, where it's like you don't maybe in that, uh, uh, maybe eat junk the only one, but it's not one where you listen once and you're singing along to the chorus. But they said, and I think this is telling, or perhaps Six by Seven's palpable rage and disdain bled through even its most arena-friendly anthems so that the masses couldn't quite identify. And I I, I do think that's true. And I, I think that's true in attitude as well. Like if, you know, if you're making more easily anthemic songs like Kasabian, maybe people appreciate the swagger. But if if these guys are kind of trying to be Pink Floyd, they said like we were trying to be, we were trying to be Pink Floyd but the people who they're promoting it to aren't seeing that. Like, yeah, it's on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> Did you read that, how it says, they once played to a room full of a and men at Leicester Charlotte with the room emptying before the first 15 minute song was complete. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> well, I don't know shit if it's a 15 minute song and you're not like a, a post-metal band or something. Uh, so yeah, I, I can on the one hand absolutely resolutely say that they're underrated but maybe more than other bands that we've talked about I can kind of understand unfortunately why they're not the timing the attitude maybe not touring enough the the sheer variety of genres that they're whipping through I think ultimately worked against them um but who knows there might be a renaissance I mean they did say in the documentary that they they reformed to play a gig and it sold out and they were kind of surprised and yeah you mentioned before how they said that um yeah it was really frustrating and you see this under every youtube comment of like this band is so underrated and here like they really fucking mean it it's not like lunch and grammar uh and maybe yeah i i think maybe they're just lovely sensitive boys and took everything too personally which i can definitely identify with um so so but yeah come back six by seven come on let, let's <laughs> let's let's watch you live because uh, i'm sure you'd be really great do you reckon you're listening to the first round? oh a hundred percent i yeah. think uh uh you know of of recent bands definitely mccluskey japan and now six by seven are are the bands that i've enjoyed so much that i'm going definitely beyond the playlist to explore some albums and let's hopefully come back for another episode in the future goodbye from me goodbye from me